People disappear every day in strange and mysterious ways. Some vanish from right under the noses of their family, while others might accidentally wander off or become victims of foul play. Some are lucky enough to be found, while many others are never seen or heard from again. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we will be looking at three instances where people disappeared. Rico Harris Rico Harris was destined for the NBA. He was supposed to have his name in lights alongside the likes of Lamar Adom and Magic Johnson. He moved from Los Angeles, California to Seattle, Washington in order to start a life and a family with his long-term girlfriend. Instead, he vanished without a trace. Rico Harris was born and raised in Los Angeles, California in 1977. He grew up with a talent for basketball and had the height to show for it. Standing at 6 feet 9 inches, Harris was destined for the life of a pro athlete. After attending a community college in the Los Angeles area, he continued his athletic career at California State Northridge, which had a newly formed yet perpetually losing Division I basketball team. The coaches there hoped that Harris would turn their losing streak around and propel them to the top of the college basketball brackets. His career there was short-lived, however, as he suffered from multiple injuries and was frequently disciplined by the coaching staff for his hard partying ways. After college, Harris was asked to join the Harlem Globetrotters due to his immense skill with sinking three-point shots from seemingly impossible distances. He prospered for a while, but was again sidelined due to injury and was forced to end his once illustrious basketball career for good. The end of an era led to an increase in personal problems for Rico. He suffered from alcohol and substance abuse and efforts made by his family to get him clean were of no use. At one point, he was seen begging on the streets for money to buy his next fix. One final attempt made by his family to get him sober resulted in him successfully completing a rehab stint in Los Angeles. When he finished the program, he met and fell in love with Jennifer Song, a visiting insurance broker who lived in Seattle. His life seemed to be getting back on track at long last, and they made plans to move in together and start a family in Seattle. But the happy ending never came. Rico Harris decided to make one last trip to his mother's house in Alhambra, just outside of Los Angeles, before driving up to Seattle the next day. Apparently, he and his mother had a disagreement of some sort, and Harris ended up leaving for Seattle in the late hours of October 9th, 2014. Heading north on Interstate 5, Harris was last seen at 10.45 a.m. on October 10th, at a gas station just outside of Sacramento, California. He had previously told his girlfriend, Jennifer, that he was going to rest in the mountains, despite having a job interview in Seattle scheduled for that same day. He was never heard from again. Several days after his disappearance, investigators found his black Nissan Maxima parked in the lot of a country park in Yolo County, California. Harris's credit cards were inside the vehicle, none of which had any charges made after his disappearance. His backpack was later found on the banks of a nearby creek. It contained his phone and phone charger. Investigators looked through the contents of his phone and found videos and selfies that Harris had taken the night of his disappearance, but they all showed Harris displaying happy, unconcerning behaviour, like singing along to some songs and remarking on the beauty of the scenery around him. A full-scale investigation was launched, with area police using cadaver dogs and aircraft outfitted with thermographic cameras to scan the heavily forested terrain. Apart from his car and backpack, there was no evidence of Harris anywhere. Investigators were baffled. How could a man so large, 6'9 and nearly 300 pounds, disappear without a trace and without a motive? It's been nearly seven years since Rico Harris seemingly vanished into thin air, and there has been no trace of him since. Steve Fawcett Steve Fawcett loved the extraordinary. Born in 1944 in Tennessee and raised in Southern California, 
Fawcett developed an aptitude for extreme sports. A financial advisor by trade, Fawcett used his massive fortune to fund his many record-breaking, continent-crossing and death-defying flights, sailing adventures and hot air balloon circumnavigations. He was a friend of billionaire Richard Branson, who frequently funded Fawcett's extreme adventures under his Virgin Global brand. But Fawcett's life wasn't brought to a close during one of his headline-grabbing world record attempts. Instead, Steve Fawcett met his end during a routine, relaxed solo flight on September 3, 2007. Fawcett took off from a private airstrip near Smith Valley, Nevada in the early morning hours of September 3, 2007. He piloted a single-engine Super Decathlon light aircraft that he had flown many times before without issue. However, six hours after takeoff, flight controllers sounded the alarm with the relevant authorities that Fawcett had not returned as scheduled. A massive search commenced, covering nearly 20,000 square miles of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The Sierra Nevadas are known for being extremely rocky and inaccessible in many areas, so most of the search had to be done by federal aircraft dispatched by the Federal Aviation Authority and local law enforcement. Richard Branson donated funds to aid the search, as well as hotel magnate Baron Hilton, who owned the airstrip that Fawcett had taken off from. The search spanned multiple law enforcement agencies, as well as private volunteer groups, and was estimated to have cost nearly $2 million. At the time, it was the largest federal recovery effort launched in the history of the United States. Despite the magnitude of the search, Fawcett was never found and was legally declared dead mere weeks later. However, nearly a year to the day of Fawcett's disappearance, a hiker camped out in the remote area of the Sierra Nevada range stumbled upon what looked to be identification cards. Upon further inspection, the cards turned out to be Fawcett's driver's license and his Federal Aviation Authority identification. An air search was quickly launched, with planes scouring the area within hours of the hiker's discovery. Steve Fawcett's plane was found about 750 yards away from where his IDs were found with investigators confirming the plane as Fawcett's based on the tail fin numbers of the plane. A search and rescue team made their way on foot to the site and eventually located two large bones at the crash site. Forensic analysis would later conclude that the bones did indeed belong to Fawcett, and the case was closed. So why would a crash like this happen to such an experienced pilot during a routine flight? Meteorologists would later conduct simulations of the weather patterns that were forecasted for that fateful day in September and concluded that excessive downdrafts around the mountain ridge were too powerful for the small prop plane to handle and forced Fawcett's plane to smash into the side of the ridge just below the peak of the mountain top. Gone Without a Trace The USS Capellin the USS Capellin was part of the Balao class of submarines and named after a tiny smelt fish found in the cold North Pacific, Atlantic and Arctic Oceans. It was first launched in January 1943 and immediately received a Navy commission by June. It quickly set sail on its first mission in September of that same year. The submarine travelled from Connecticut to Brisbane, Australia to conduct patrols in the surrounding waters and prevent Japanese attacks. On its very first war patrol, the Capellin managed to sink a massive Japanese cargo ship out in the seas surrounding Indonesia, earning the crew high praise for their successful attack. At the beginning of November, the submarine returned to Darwin, Australia, for an overhaul. It required some corrections because there were slight defects in the radar and hatch mechanisms, and certain parts were making too much noise. Within a week, the Capellin was back out in the water and set off for its second patrol. This time, the officers monitored the trade routes through the seas surrounding Indonesia and the Philippines. Their task was to observe, engage if necessary, and return during the cover of night on the 6th of December. While they were out at sea, they came within sight of another American submarine, the USS Bonefish. Unaware that it was a friendly vessel, 
the Capellin dove to escape, so the commander quickly sent a sonar message relaying his identity. The Capellin acknowledged the notice and identification, but nothing further. It continued with its dive and patrol mission. That interaction was the last known contact of the submarine Capellin. Investigators discovered the only attack reported in the area was in Japanese records by one of their mine layer vessels near Indonesia. The report specifically stated that the submarine attack produced many black oil and water columns filled with wood splinters. Researchers and the Navy only later discovered that the Japanese had placed minefields in the areas that the Capellin had been monitoring. They suspect that a mine explosion had destroyed the submarine. The submarine and her crew received a battle star for their service because, despite having been in commission for only half a year and one patrol, they managed to sink over 3,000 tons of enemy shipping. There has been no search for the wreckage and no trace of the submarine or its crew, so the Navy listed the USS Capellin as lost with unknown cause. But what do you make of these three stories? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.